Hello, this is Hans Golf Zero Uniform Papa Lima. Today I'm going to talk about using QRP transmitters to track high altitude balloons. The first question is why do we use QRP? And the answers for this are pretty much that you're putting a radio on a balloon and the balloon can only carry a very limited payload. So you couldn't attach any base, basically any bow tankers or a kilowatt linear. You couldn't attach a car battery to power the whole thing. And so you really are limited to low power. So it's a perfect application for QRP. There are two types of high altitude balloons. And the first is weather balloons. They're made of a latex rubbery type of material, typically two to five meters in diameter. They can carry quite a large payload, perhaps even a kilogram or two and they basically fly up and up and up and as they go up and the air pressure decreases the latex continues to stretch without limit until eventually the balloon bursts and down it comes. Typically people put a parachute on these and the chase teams try and recover the balloon and they fit cameras on board and take photographs and videos so uh, you can take very nice pictures that show the curvature of the earth and the sky is black and tracking typically uses very short range VHF, UHF uh, radios such as APRS and, and data transceivers that uh, only need to cover a few hundred kilometers at most. These projects are quite large, big projects and often undertaken by university teams. You can see here a picture I found showing an example uh, payload for one of these high altitude balloons using the latex type and it contains a camera there for taking photographs and videos. There's a 900 megahertz radio modem with 64 kilometers range. There's a cellular modem with a cellular antenna and a GPS antenna, a temperature sensor, power supplies. Now with one of these flights you clearly don't have to worry too much about the weight that it can carry and the power source can be a battery that will last for a few hours because the flight will all be over in a few hours. The second type of balloon is what we're going to concentrate on today and is known as a floater balloon. It's also known as super pressure balloon or a pico balloon. And these are very small balloons, typically only a meter in diameter and a sort of pillow shape often. And the typical type of mylar film balloon that you can find in party shops all over the world. So there's nothing unusual about these balloons. Now the important thing is that they're inelastic. They, as they float upwards in the atmosphere, they reach an altitude where the gas inside fully inflates the balloon. So you typically launch them very underinflated, and they reach a equilibrium with the external pressure where they can't extend, they can't expand anymore. And at that point, they reach this equilibrium altitude where they don't burst and they just float along in the wind. And they can go for a very, very long distance. They can fly around the world. Uh, we've had one that's flown around the world 12 times, lasting several months in duration. The downside is they have a very low payload capability and that gives quite considerable communications challenges. We need a transmitter that has very low weight and is very small. It also needs a GPS on board and a power source and of course an antenna for both the radio and the GPS. At the same time, the communications have got to cover thousands of miles of ocean because this transmitter is not just going straight up and straight down like on a latex balloon. This transmitter is going to reach an equilibrium altitude at which it's going to float around the world potentially. So clearly the VHF, the short range of VHF is no good for this and we typically tend to use uh, HF communications with a good propagation during the daytime such as 20 meters or 30 meters and really really very low power, 10 or 20 milliwatts is quite typical. And this is why the talk is titled Extreme QRP, because we have to be tiny, with tiny power, tiny transmitters, very, very lightweight, typically no more than 10 grams, which is less than a third of an ounce. So weak signal techniques, as you'll come to see, uh, including whisper, are the very important savior to the day here. 
Well, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and in this case I uh, have been following the flights of LEO M0XER who flew 64 balloon flights up until July 2014 and typically was using UHF transmitters with a weight of about 10 to 15 grams and a couple of those are pictured here. He used sometimes solar panels and in some cases uh, a battery, a fixed battery. Uh, typically only about 10 milliwatts transmitter. In the end he had three flights which circum circumnavigated the world and one of those went round six times. The other giant that I had been following was VK3YT, Andy, and he has uh, quite a few flights and he's still flying the balloons today. He flew various experiments with VHF, UHF and HF transmitters. The ones that were most interesting to me because of the uh, continuity of transmissions even across oceans were the HF transmitters and he again was using 20 meters, 30 meters whisper and JT9 which is another weak signal mode and using standard type of party balloons. There's a photograph here that shows one of his trackers and the weight of the board there is 2.34 grams and you can see on this tracker there's a microcontroller, there's a GPS on the left hand side there and there's a ceramic chip antenna which is the GPS antenna. In early 2014 I had an email from Dave VE3KCL and Dave was interested in putting an Ultimate 3S kit on a balloon. The Ultimate 3S is one of the kits which I designed for QRP Labs and which was the main kit, the main product back in 2014. It can transmit a variety of weak signal modes including Whisper and including JT9 and various other weak signal modes narrowband modes which are ideal for this long distance communication because of the very high signal to noise ratio. So of course there was no way that Dave was going to fly uh, that black box that you see there in the photograph on the top right on the balloon which was much too heavy and so he developed um, a system using a, a series of off-the-shelf modules that weighed around 30 to 35 grams and included an Arduino Nano which includes the Atmega 328 processor, the same processor as used in the Ultimate 3S and the QRP Labs SI 5351A synthesizer which you can see there on, on the bottom left in the bottom photograph, a GPS module that you see there on the bottom right, uh, battery and boost regulator which are on the top and top center. Of course he also has to attach antennas for the HF radio and for the GPS. So this email from Dave really initiated a long series of developments and friendship which has spanned the intervening years and continues to this day. This is a block diagram of the VE3 KCL payload uh, back in the beginning there in 2014 and uh, you can see the various modules which I have spoken about and how they connected together. It's important to realize the Arduino Nano was actually not acting as an Arduino Nano at all. It was programmed with a special version of the QRP Labs Ultimate 3S firmware and it was only used really on, on the uh, flight because it was a much smaller board than the QRP Labs board which had never been designed with ballooning in mind. Here is an example of one of the solar panel arrangements that uh, Dave for E3KCL used on his flight. In this case, a series of eight solar panels. These solar panels are incredibly fragile, um, very, very thin glass and quite difficult to solder together. Dave mounts those on this pink uh, polystyrene insulation material. The antennas that we use are typically dipole antennas for the HF side of things. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to have the transmitter at the middle of the dipole directly feeding the dipole legs and one end of the dipole tied to the balloon with the other end of the dipole hanging down freely. Dave has also experimented with tri uh, double band antennas using three legs, uh, two legs hanging down separated somewhat. Um, this is always involving compromises uh, like any multiband antenna and uh, in the more recent flights we've concentrated on 20 meters. The GPS antenna is interesting and a lot of people use this small 
chip antenna shown in the bottom left here. Uh, these are not particularly sensitive. Uh, they're very good in a cell phone where there's very limited space, but uh, they're not particularly sensitive. A much more sensitive antenna is the patch antenna shown there in the photograph on the left. But there's quite a significant weight penalty to that, which makes it unsuitable for use on the balloons. The antenna we've found most effective is a simple dipole antenna. At 1575 megahertz, the quarter wave length is something like 45 millimeters. And so we make a dipole antenna as shown there on one of the early prototypes of, of the tracker and uh, 45 millimeters on each leg and then a twisted wire feed line which prevent, provides a very good 50 m match to the receiver. Now on to communications modes. As I've mentioned, VHF and UHF APRS and other data transceivers in the UHF range are fine for short range, but no good for the global floater balloons that we're talking about here. Andy VK3YT developed a special telemetry on JT9. Uh, JT9 carries 13 characters, and he purposed those to carry his balloon telemetry. And he required special software that had to be installed and run by volunteer receiver stations. So the disadvantage there is a limited number of stations to monitor for the signals around the world. Whisper is ideal in so far as having a global network of receiving stations, but the disadvantage there is a very limited information content consisting of just the four character grid square. Uh, the four character grid square has a typical size of around 100 miles on each side, depending on what latitude you're at. So it doesn't give a very precise location information. And of course, it doesn't give you any information about altitude. So some more information about the weak signal propagation reporter mode created by Joe K1JT. It's a very popular mode worldwide and used mainly as a propagation tool. It's got very powerful narrow bandwidth forward error correction, uh, which gives it a very high signal to noise ratio and it can be copied even below the noise. So it encodes 50 bits of information that include the call sign, uh, which is four to six characters of call sign without a prefix or a suffix and a grid square, four character grid square, as I mentioned, which only has a resolution of about 100 miles and a tr transmission power, which is in DBM. So the transmission is made up of 162 symbols, each one of which is one of four tones, which are spaced by only 1.46 hertz. So it gives the message a six hertz bandwidth and a message transmission takes almost two minutes, one minute, 52 seconds, in fact. And shown here on the picture on the bottom is a series of uh, three whisper transmissions. So you can see what they would look like on a waterfall. The receiving stations decode and log the whisper reports that they receive to an internet database so that the then transmitter station or indeed the receiving stations or anybody else can go onto this WhisperNet website and look at the database showing who has been receiving your signal or whose signal you are receiving. And there's a, a map which you can use which shows who has been receiving your signal. So this example, show, the map here, shows uh, some transmissions that I made on 20 meters and uh, the stations that were receiving me. So as I mentioned, Dave VE3KCL and I started a long collaboration which has gone on now for the last six or seven years. And we bounce ideas back and forth between each other. And the roles that we play in the project are that I am developing the software and the electronics and the PCB layouts. Um, Dave is doing what I call the hard work, uh, all the actual launches and the construction of the uh, boards and filling the balloons with gas and all of the early morning excursions to the beach to launch the balloons. So all the hard work there, as I call it. He's also doing a lot of experiments on the electronic side as well, particularly with the power supplies. So very early on, after the first few flights that Dave made with the special Ultimate 3S firmware version, um, I developed this balloon telemetry protocol, which actually sits on top of Whisper. And it transmits one normal Whisper message, which sends the Maidenhead grid square, for example here, shown IO90. Um, it, and then a second message, which has the same format, but encodes 
all of the X's that you see there, so four, four of the six characters of the call sign, as well as the uh, locator characters and the power characters. And it identifies in the WhisperNet database these telemetry transmissions by using a call sign that starts with 0, 1 or Q. These call signs have never been used by the ITU, they're not issued by the ITU, and so we're able to use them to create 30 unique channels for telemetry which cover uh, 0, 1 and Q first characters with a third character of 0 to 9. The beauty of this system is that the Whisper reporting network globally automatically receives all the balloon data transmissions uh, without any special software, without any of the Whisper monitoring stations needing to do anything. And so all of these uh, reports are logged into the internet database where they can be extracted and used to retrieve the telemetry and the position information. So in our case, uh, we are encoding the X characters in the whisper message to contain uh, the telemetry containing the fifth and sixth maidenhead subsquare characters so we get a much higher position accuracy of just a few miles, the maidenhead grid subsquare. We get the altitude information to a resolution of 20 meters, temperature, battery voltage, ground speed and GPS status which is basically whether or not the GPS has got a valid fix and how many satellites are being received. Here I show an example decoding. You can see at the top there two transmissions on Whisper, uh, which are two minutes apart, as all Whisper transmissions are. The first one is a standard Whisper transmission, and the second one is a telemetry transmission, where the first character in this case is zero, and the third char character is zero also. All the other characters in that transmission are ca carrying the telemetry, which I mentioned on the previous slide. So in this case, it's a VE3KCL call sign, and it shows the full six characters of his locator, an altitude of 80 meters, temperature of 36 centigrade, 3.8 volts battery, and a ground speed of zero. He was actually testing this on the ground. I developed a spreadsheet which extracts all of the telemetry reports from the WhisperNet database once every couple of minutes and when it finds a report for the balloon uh, which are transmitted during daytime once every 10 minutes it updates this Google map. So shown here is one of our balloons which was a quite successful balloon flight and it's on, on its seventh lap around the world. We started using color coding of each lap corresponding to the resistor color codes. So you can see there the end of this flight currently, or the current position, is over Europe and is a purple color, which means it's on its seventh lap. We also get back all of this information on the altitude and the ground speed, temperature and battery voltage, and these are all plotted onto graphs. Now to the actual balloon hardware. There have been three versions of hardware, three main versions, and uh, Firstly, the off-the-shelf version of the Ultimate 3S, which I showed before, and I think Dave actually designed some PCBs for this in the end. These were running special versions of the Ultimate 3S firmware, and there were 26 flights in total. It was basically the Ultimate 3S, but without the LCD and the buttons and the large circuit board, and running a special firmware that did the balloon telemetry, the whisper telemetry. That then evolved into a product development for QRP Labs, which was called the Ultimate 3B, or U3B for short, a really tiny board, which was also using the Atmega 328 processor and running a basic interpreter for the flight configuration. 28 flights were run with that, including many circumnavigating flights, and uh, the hardware has always performed very well, very successfully. Uh, two years ago, that changed into the Ultimate 4B product development, uh, which uses the STM32 processor and a much more advanced operating system. There have been 19 flights of that to date. Here are some pictures of the Ultimate 3B, a really tiny circuit board, just 1.5 times 0.5 inches, and weighing only 1.5 grams, uh, which is 0.05 ounces. SMD components on both sides of the board and you can see a line of GPIO along the board there which is all accessible by the basic interpreter and so you can make your own uh, enhancements to the system if you wish. 
here are some more pictures of the U3B prototype with my hand for reference so you can see the tiny scale of the thing. Um, we did later develop a larger PCB for it, about twice the size, which was just easier to work with and not very much heavier. So the U3B was using the same processor as the Ultimate 3S, the Atmega 328, but a very different firmware. The U3B runs a virtual machine, which I developed, and a basic interpreter, which controls all aspects of the transmitter, the GPS, and the GPIO pins, sensors if you want to read them, and so on. So you basically configure over the serial port a basic program which configures exactly how you want the flight computer to operate. It provides a lot of flexibility and at the same time a simple way of setting up a flight. Well, Dave and I were at the FDIM 2019, two years ago now, at the Holiday Inn Fairbourne in Dayton, and we were discussing one evening the tracker, and as a result of that, the U3B tracker product development evolved into the U4B tracker, and that became the new product development. This uses the STM32F103 processor, a much more powerful 32-bit ARM processor with a USB peripheral that lets me have an onboard USB interface for configuration of the tracker. The board size is the same and the weight approximately the same, also 1.5 grams and slightly smaller board size in fact. The same SI5351A synthesizer as a transmitter and an LM75 temperature sensor and it now has a TCXO reference for very, very stable frequency output. The firmware is now completely new, uh, called QDOS, QRP Labs Disk Operating System. The pun was not entirely unintentional. Here is a photograph of one side of the Ultimate 4B tracker, and you can see here at the top this section of board, which in the final production version will hold a USB mini connector. And this section of board is designed to be snapped off along this row of holes here. So once you've configured it as you want it and finished testing, you'll snap off this section for weight reduction. After that, the board weighs about 1.5 grams. And you can see here the STM32F103 processor. On the left side here is the SI5351A synthesizer, which is used as a transmitter and the TCXO reference for it. And on the right side here, this is the LM75 temperature sensor. On the next page here we see a photograph of the other side of the board. So again, this board has got uh, components on both sides. And on this one we have the SIM30, SIM28M GPS module. And here is an e uh, EEPROM which is used for storing the program. We also see again this row of GPIO pads along the bottom here. So you can connect to this um, any I2C sensors, any uh, serial connection that you wanted, or any uh, single analog to digital conversion inputs here. You can use these inputs for those purposes, all under control of the basic program. Now I'll give a demonstration of how the QDOS system works. And uh, I'm using here a terminal emulator called PuTTY on Linux. But in principle, any terminal emulator could be used. And all you have to do is connect that to the uh, USB device, which is the U4B. And so you come in and you've got a menu here, which you can scroll up and down. And the idea is that there's a very, very basic flight configuration page here, uh, where you'd input your call sign and the transmission frequency and some basic parameters. And that would allow you to run a simple tracking flight without getting any further involved into anything. Just simply configure your call sign and the operating frequency and away you go. However, if you do want to get into further details, the functionality is extremely rich. And so there's a file manager here, which you can create new directories. Um, you can open files from here. So this is a, a directory called hands and it contains a directory called test. You can come back up the file manager directory tree. And the initial program which is run is this one called main, but you can have as many other programs here as you want. And the program can call out to another program as well. So you can have um, sub programs. 
I can then edit any file I want to and there's a full screen text editor built in so that uh, you don't need to do any development whatsoever on the host PC you just literally run a command window or a terminal window onto the U4B and do all your work on here. In the file manager there's also a disk manager here which shows the status of the disk and how much free space there is. The disk is actually written on the EEPROM, there's a 128k EEPROM um, as you see here at the bottom 98% free in this example and this will show you the structure of the disk and how fragmented it is and allow you to defragment it if you need to. There's also a command line where you can do pretty much everything that you can do from within the file manager for example. You can also look at the contents of programs so let me just type the test program and you see that it just has a loop in it. I can also run that from the command line here and I'm also able to execute any basic statements directly from the command line which is very useful for testing sensors and all kind of testing parts of the program. There's a hardware test feature here that allows me to test all aspects of the hardware and see any failures. Um, in this case uh, the failures are highlighted in red. There's a factory reset option which gets me straight back to the factory configuration with a default set of programs on it. And finally here there's a firmware update option. The firmware update is extremely easy. Uh, the device appears as a USB flash drive and you simply copy in the new firmware file. Uh, you can run the program here and uh, for test purposes and in the editor I can open a file from the operating system such as this one and I can compile the file. I can also debug the file and what I have here is a integrated debugger in the device itself where I can uh, step through line by line here uh, or I can just run the program here back in the editor and now back to the front page. So you can see it's a complete operating system with a text editor, um, a way to edit programs, a way to debug programs step by step to run the entire program. Uh, there's a file manager for setting up sub programs and editing them and a command line with various functionality to test the hardware, uh, edit files, create directories, create files, everything like that. So a really nice complete system on a very tiny board uh, with very flexible interfaces. It has the input output pins, it has access to any sensors on the I2C bus and it can transmit any of the modes which can be transmitted by the Ultimate 3S, including Whisper, uh, JT9, JT65, QRSS modes, plain CW, uh, and all, all the modes which the Ultimate 3S supports. In summary, Kudos has a 128K disk implemented on EEPROM chip. It has a simple flight configuration tool which allows you to get started quickly without needing to get into any further details has a suite of applications including a text editor for its basic programming language, a debugger, file manager and command line. There are eight pads along the edge of the board which can be configured as analog inputs, digital input output pins or the I2C bus is exposed for connecting further sensors or serial data sensors so there's a lot of expansion capabilities possible and you can log data to files on the disk. So there's a lot of functionality there that probably actually open up the small board to further applications as well as ballooning. Well, ballooning isn't easy. Be prepared for failures, perhaps multiple failures, and to learn as you go and to get better at it. Dave's first flight, the S1 flight, lasted only two and a half hours, 
and he's gone from that point to being able to reliably launch balloons that work almost every time and circumnavigate the globe uh, reliably, often multiple times. We have a flight that's running at the moment that is now on its 12th lap as I make this. One of the main enemies is weather and you need to get high enough to be above the weather. 11,000 meters is a good height to aim for and once you're above that then you pretty much have avoided nearly all of the bad weather. If you encounter clouds uh, that will ice up the balloon surface and increase the weight which will cause you to come down. So you need to launch on a day which doesn't have clouds, which doesn't have wind which could cause the balloon to be driven into the ground or into nearby obstacles. Um, you can have balloon failures due to overfilling it, uh, miscalculating the amount of gas you need at the launch. You can have electronics failures with launch dramas, all kinds of launch dramas can happen. The antenna can get tangled up, the tracker can be dragged along the ground in a sudden downdraft. All sorts of things can go wrong and so overall the, the whole topic really does require persistence. So we'll talk about some of the other things you'll need to know if you're crazy enough to attempt uh, balloon flights. One of which is regulations. So regulations vary by country and do check the regulations in your particular country. For example, the UK does not allow aeronautical transmissions in its amateur radio license at all. However, regulations anyway are often a grey area. What is allowed for an unattended beacon operation, which is arguably what a balloon transmission is. And SEPT licensing is another question as your license um, transits into another country, as it flies over another country, what does that allow and what does it not allow? Uh, it doesn't actually allow unattended beacon operation. So, uh, and, and then again, you could fly over all kinds of countries. You could fly over North Korea, for example, and perhaps they uh, wouldn't allow your license to operate over their airspace. And so, it's a somewhat grey area um, how, how far you worry about such a thing, but at the end of the day you're talking about a very small, very light transmitter flying at a very high altitude. It's not really likely to be noticed and it's not likely that your 20 milliwatts is going to disturb anybody. So you have to interpret it how you see fit. Safety is another important issue. Uh, it goes without saying you should avoid power lines anywhere near your launch site which could get tangled up in your antenna. And you should launch in a large open area without people or traffic that you can trip over as you run around trying to get your precious tracker off the ground safely without smashing the solar panels. Uh, then consider the gas you're going to use. Helium is a very safe gas, it's inexplosive. Um, but it's very expensive and it's also a non-renewable resource on Earth which would arguably be best kept for more important uses such as medical uses. Hydrogen has a much higher lift and is much cheaper but it's explosive and it needs handling with more care. Aviation safety is another question which is often asked and uh, after all the balloon flight area around 11,000 meters that we're aiming for is similar to the cruising altitude of commercial airliners. In this instance, it's worth remembering that around 650,000 weather balloons are launched annually, which is 1,800 daily from 900 locations worldwide. They're very much larger and much heavier than the tiny payloads we're talking about with these floater balloons and yet there have been no reported incidents with aircraft since 1929 when the first weather balloons were launched. In most countries such small balloons that we're talking about don't require any permission from aviation authorities to fly. There are also some bird species which fly at similar altitudes such as Rappel's vulture which is found at 11 kilometers altitude where commercial airliners fly and these balloons fly and they weigh 9 kilograms which is again very much bigger than the 10 grams we're talking about here. 
I've also spoken with several commercial airline pilots over the last few years and none of them had any concerns whatsoever about sharing their airspace with such a small thing and they all thought that their plane would come out the winner in th if there was any interaction between the two which itself is very very unlikely. An important first question to answer is what balloons you'll be using to carry your payload and Qualitex are a brand which is well known in America and Europe and uh, they supply suitable balloons in 36 inch diameter size uh, which we were using for some of the earlier flights. The party balloons are generally uh, uh, possible to use but perhaps not the best because they're not generally designed for low leakage and the print on them necessarily adds a little bit of unnecessary extra weight. Certainly don't get the type of party balloons that come in all kinds of weird shapes and sizes because the weight to volume ratio just deteriorates. We've had very great success and in fact the best success with Chinese balloons which are very very cheap. A 10 pack from China costs only $15 delivered and so that's $1.5 per balloon. Uh, very very cheap and they've also been found to be the most reliable that we've seen with the least leakage and the least probability of bursting. So really in this case cheap is actually best. There's a Californian company, SBS, uh, which makes balloons, uh, very large balloons in fact, and uh, they'll certainly get you to a higher altitude or allow you to carry a higher payload, but you'll be spending around $100 per balloon, plus a lot of extra money on the gas to fill them because they're much larger. And there is some evidence, at least on recent flights which I've seen, that the reliability is not particularly high. You can also make your own balloons to your own size and shape and this was of course something that uh, M0XCR did, he made his own balloons and uh, there's also more information on this in the accompanying conference proceedings article. Uh, Dave has had a go at this too. The other questions you'll want to ask or answer is how many balloons you'll use and so of course you could use more and more balloons and that will allow you to have a higher payload or reach a higher altitude and but it will also give you a higher probability of failure since if one of those balloons fails your flight will come down. Pre-stretching is something that Dave has worked a lot on and you can see in this picture some four balloons being pre-stretched in his house. He finds that this actually really improves the duration of the flights by preparing the, the plastic in advance and it also achieves a higher float altitude. You also need to understand how much gas to fill the balloons with prior to the launch. Uh, there's spreadsheets available for calculating this and again look for more details in the article. Power sources are an important topic too and unless you are only planning a very quick demonstration flight uh, you'll definitely want to have solar panels so that you can have a long duration flight and still be able to track your balloon. And so there are flexible panels, there are the glass panels. Um, generally we've been using the glass panels, they're very very thin and easily broken, but uh, Dave has turned this into an advantage and figured out ways to cut the panels into smaller pieces so that he can reduce weight and still have adequate power to run the flight. Then there's the question of whether to fly with a battery or not. You can fly without a battery and just put a capacitor on the board, maybe an electrolytic capacitor just to smooth out any power fluctuations that could be caused by the solar panels rotating in and out of the sunshine. And so, but uh, if you include batteries, you will generally be able to get a couple of extra hours of flight time at the end of the day. So far the longest we were able to continue transmitting after sunlight fell below the angle required to generate enough power from solar panels was about four hours. Generally the batteries that we use, the lithium, lithium polymer batteries, do not do very well in the extreme cold and so in some cases it gets too cold to operate before the battery runs out of charge. 
uh, nickel cadmium batteries uh, have a much lower charge density so a much worse capacity versus weight ratio and uh, nickel metal hydride are somewhere in between uh, so generally lithium polymer batteries are the preference because they have a very high power density to, to weight However, published data is not everything because, of course, that's at room temperature, whereas when we're up at 11,000 metres, we can encounter extreme cold and nickel metal hydride and nickel cadmium actually do better in the extreme cold than lithium polymer. So it's an open area for future experiments to see whether or not actually nickel cadmium would provide a better service in the extreme cold. Ultra capacitors are another option but don't really have very much use after sunlight ends because really the energy density is very much lower than uh, batteries. Forecast tools, well, there are a very large number of tools which can be used to have an idea of where your flight is going to go next, which is always interesting. On the day of the launch, you certainly want to be very well aware of the weather and remember that the weather at the ground is not necessarily the weather at 11,000 metres and ideally you need a very clear path up without any clouds between you at the ground level and the final floating altitude at 11 or 12,000 metres. A tool which we use a lot is the NOAA model which gives what we've found to be a very accurate projection over the next few days of where the balloon is going to go to next. There are also tools for visualizing the wind and the pressure isobars at different altitudes and so these are all very interesting things to study and to learn about while tracking the balloon. There are a lot more details about these tools and links to the tools in the conference proceedings article which accompanies this talk. Testing, the importance of testing, cannot be overemphasized. Test everything thoroughly on the ground because you absolutely do not have the opportunity to go and visit your balloon for repairs when it's somewhere at 11,000 meters over Outer Mongolia. Testing in the cold is also worthwhile because some components and some faults may only come out when the devices are very cold. Uh, I would certainly think that doing it in the domestic freezer would be better than nothing. Dave took his testing to extremes with this three-layered Peltier cooling device, which he managed to get things down below minus 50 centigrade. It's water-cooled. It generates a huge amount of heat in, in the process of cooling a small chamber in the middle down to minus 50 centigrade. That was quite a huge project in its own right. In summary, and I would emphasize here that this is a huge topic and that I have only necessarily, uh, due to the time limitation, scratched the surface, there is a very large article in the conference proceedings booklet which accompanies this conference. And so many of the topics which I've just briefly touched on here are gone into on very much more detail in the conference proceedings article which is written partly by myself and also partly by Dave VE3KCL. The U4B will hopefully be available soon and inexpensively from QRP Labs and uh, it only remains for me to warn you that ballooning is extremely addictive. I don't know of anybody I think who's only launched a single balloon. Uh, it tends to be quite an addiction. Ballooning is great fun and is educational and ballooning is extreme QRP in every sense of the word. And now I believe we will have a question and answer session. Dave VE3KCL should also be here available to answer your questions on the ballooning aspect and I can answer any questions on the firmware and the U4B. I hope you enjoyed the talk and thank you very much for listening.